Hi, my name is Andromeda, my pronouns are she, they, and today we'll be discussing debates about queer terminology in Germany during the Weimar era, and the emergence of a queer identity alongside respectability politics within the homosexual emancipation movement. Though the word homosexual was widely used by gay men and lesbians by the 1920s, it was not clearly loved by everyone. Many hoped for new terminology to be found that emphasized love and relationships, and consequently might make it easier to accept publicly. A few used homoerotic as an alternative. Others preferred a German term I'm going to do my best to pronounce Gleichgeschlechtli, which translates approximately to same-sex. Some talked of male-male eros, or favored love. Another simple possibility was suggested by a popular cabaret tune from 1920 called The Lavender Song, which used the term different from the rest which had been used by Richard Oswald as the title of his 1919 film, and would pop up again and again in the magazines of the decade. The German equivalent for gay, or schwul, was seen largely as a slur at the time, and wouldn't gain popular use until the reclamation of this terminology in the 70s and 80s, the reason why I've tried hard to avoid using this term so far in this series, as it wasn't appropriate within the historical context of the time. The most common alternative to homosexual in the Weimar era was friend. It was frequently used in the names of homosexual and lesbian clubs, as well as by many magazines originating in this era. Friend and friendship put the emphasis on the emotional and personal context of the relationship. People in the know might be able to infer what kind of relationship was meant by the context, whereas others, ignorant of the double meaning, could innocently assume that an ordinary friendship was being mentioned. Other options were terms associated with sexological theories of gender inversion, such as third sex and Uranian. Though these were not liked by many, especially masculine gay men were not fond of the increasing links of intersexuality and effeminacy with homosexuality that these terms contributed to. Female homosexuals used the female form of friend, frundin, as well as lesbian, and occasionally tribaid, though this term was rare by the 1920s. Alternatively, they might refer to the Greek poet Sappho. Very common as well were terms describing the gendered appearance and role of a woman. Both the female form of lad Booby, also pointing to the bobbed haircut popular in the 1920s, and Garçon, the feminine version of the French word for bachelor, implied a masculine appearance, and could be loosely translated today as butch. In the literature and friendship magazines of the 1920s, Masculine lesbians might be described as the Ben-Hur type and Don Juans. The femme role was less likely to be named, although sometimes the word Maddie or Dame were used. Femme lesbians were often explicitly described rather than denoted in the friendship magazines of the day. Additionally, Dual gender roles were embraced by the lesbian community in a way that they were not by the male gay community.
As many scholars have argued, there is good reason to believe that something like a homosexual identity was becoming firmly articulated in the two decades on either side of the turn of the century. Not only did terminology and self-identification strengthen feelings of homosexual identity, but queer people were beginning to see themselves, despite their diversity, as a single group. This can be seen in the allyship between the lesbian and transvestite communities at the time, as many lesbian magazines also addressed and advocated for a trans audience, contributing to ongoing discussions. Many others talked about the need for solidarity, as they shared common challenges and problems, establishing a sense of shared identity. In the early 1920s, the magazine Friendship laid the groundwork for a new political approach based on winning respectability for homosexuals. What we often view as the homophile strategy of the 1950s, namely the belief that homosexuals could acquire public tolerance for their sexuality by acting in orderly, self-disciplined, and gender-appropriate ways, was actually pioneered by the editors of this magazine and eventually adopted by Friedrich Ratzewitz Press and political organization. Respectability politics continues to be a part of major debates regarding homosexuality, advocating for a strategy of accommodating to the wants and norms of heteronormative society as a way of fitting in and gaining public support. Often this approach marginalizes and oppresses other queer people who don't fit into binary cishet categories, putting them down as a method for gaining self-acceptance and not deconstructing or undermining any of the structures which continue to harm and oppress the queer community. Let me know if you'd like to see a video covering respectability politics within the queer community. This strategy worked itself into the queer politics of Germany across the coming centuries, as many idealized and looked back nostalgically on the queer publications and periodicals of the Weimar era, which centered this approach. Slowing down the rebuilding and progress of the movement following the Second World War. Debates about queer terminology and allyship within the homosexual movement contributed to an emerging queer identity, which strengthened the movement. Unfortunately, the dominance of respectability politics, beginning in the early 1920s, undermined some of the more radical work of the Weimar era, and slowed down the progress of the movement to come. In the next video, we'll discuss prejudices around queer identities and the country's sodomy law in more detail. Thank you for watching. I hope you learned some valuable queer history. And I'll see you in the next video.